Hello, everyone. Welcome back to the Radical Exchange Annual Conference. Our next session will be Identity Politics as Elite Capture. Let's begin. Great. Uh, thank you, Femi, for joining us here at uh, RxC Conference 2020. Uh, really, truly excited to have you and uh, unpack some of the ideas you've explored around identity politics. Uh, and uh, yeah, please go ahead. Yeah, thanks for having me. Um, so I think it's good to get on the same page about what the problem is with identity politics, um, because I think you know, there are a variety of things that people are complaining about when they feel that something has gone wrong with identity politics. Um, and the way I think about it might not be the same way that everyone thinks about it. So I like to think of two kinds of examples to frame what I think is going wrong with identity politics now. So what a lot of people might imagine is the more cynical calculating sort of elite capture when I say that the problem with identity politics is elite capture. So an example of that is um, I live in Washington DC and our mayor Muriel Bowser commissioned artists to paint Black Lives Matter on 16th Street in front of the White House, um, named the street Black Lives Matter Avenue or something. And this is, I think, less than a month after she submitted her last police budget, which um, increased the budget going to the police by something on the order of $45 million, right? So she's using the kind of aesthetics, language, and idea of radical politics, of Black liberatory politics to advance um, an agenda that isn't in lockstep with what that political project actually demands. And, you know, I think the most plausible read of that is that cynical and intentional. And that's certainly um, an example of elite capture, but I don't think it's the central thing that we should think of when we think of elite capture. So I think a more generalizable example comes from E. Franklin Frazier, who's a black sociologist who I studied a lot to come up with this idea of elite capture in the first place. Um, and in Black Bourgeoisie, he talks about the Black Newspaper Journal and Guide, which was run by um, Black middle class people, um, and talks about an example of them celebrating the election of a Black doctor to the presidency of a local affiliate of the American Medical Association. And Frazier's problem with the celebration of this doctor is the fact that this doctor opposes socialized medicine which would no doubt have benefited working class African Americans, um, much more so than the optics of this one, you know, relatively privileged person ascending, you know, breaking a racial barrier and ascending to the presidency of this local affiliate of the American Medical Association. So the elite capture problem with identity politics, as I think of it, is just the fact that some people are using identity politics as a weapon against consolidated group interests rather than using it to build solidarity. Um, and I think the Comedy River Collective statement, which is popularized, maybe even invented the concept of identity politics, um, is very much in the opposite direction. As they explain it, um, the point of it is to advance a radical politics towards systemic change for everyone. Barbara Smith, who is one of the founders of the Comedy River Collective, has said um, in a number of recent interviews that you know, the point of identity politics was compatible with working on common problems and acting in solidarity. So I think the elite capture problem kind of shows both the promise and danger of identity politics. But I think if we stare at it more closely, we're gonna find that identity, pro identity politics isn't actually the problem. Um, in fact, identity politics is a reaction to what the real problem is, which is, of course, what I'm saying, elite capture. Um, so I think I'll just briefly explain how elite capture goes and then try and tie it to the present moment. 
So I actually get help in describing how elite capture works from the unlikely source of the philosophy of games. And the reason why games are helpful is because games um, involve design choices and practical agency. So a game is a world where you can act in a certain way. And the thing about games that makes them fun and that makes them playable at all is the fact that your choices in this artificial small world that we create for the game are simple, right? Um, it's the clarity of the choices that helps make games fun. I know how to, what I have to do in basketball, right? I try to score, I try to, you know, pass the ball to people who are on my team. I try to prevent people from on the other team from scoring. There's a clear system that marks progress and um, regress, right? There's a point system. There are all these things that simplify life in the world of the game of basketball compared to the larger world where no one's keeping score, where we don't know exactly how the things that we're going to do or refrain from doing are going to fit into our larger goals, where we don't have any of that kind of clarity that makes games what they are. And Teen Wen, who wrote the book Games, Agency as Art, talks about how we can treat aspects of the real world as if they were games by imposing artificial clarity on them. So think about exercising to maintain your health, right? If you're just thinking about health and wellness, you might think about your strength and flexibility and cardiovascular endurance, um, but you might get a Fitbit or something else that counts your steps, right? Which is a much clearer, much simpler goal, more steps. Um, and that simple goal might take the place of your larger, more complex idea of what you're exercising for. So instead of trying to make your exercise maximally good from a health perspective, you might try to maximize the amount of steps that you take. Um, replacing the role of the complex value of health and wellness with the simple goal of number of steps. So in the political world, we see versions of that, right? Because elites have structuring like power in our social world. Elites make laws, elites decide how institutions function, and these kind of dictate the rules of play for everybody else. So they play a role analogous to the role that game designers play. On top of that, elites have a simpler, clearer role in society. Um, so using the example of black politics and thinking about a class differential, um, black working class people also face discrimination and lack of racial representation um, and slights and you know, microaggressions. If, you know, they face those things, but they also face them along with poverty and disproportionate vulnerability to police violence and incarceration and debt traps and all of those extra things that black middle class people face less of. Um, so comparatively, they're playing a simpler game. And Kianga Yamada Taylor in um, From Black Lives Matter to Black Liberation has really done, um, I think, an exemplary job of showing why this matters politically. Um, and a particularly clear part of the book is where she's talking about the 2015 um, murder of Freddie Gray by the Baltimore Police Department. The uprising in Baltimore that occurred in response to his brutal murder happened in a black city with a black mayor and a black com police commissioner. It was investigated by a black state's attorney and locally and federally by a Department of Justice run by a Black Attorney General, all of whom served under Black President Barack Obama, right? And these people essentially got off scot-free, right? So the system is working for elites. It's not working for everyone else. And the kinds of intellectual reflexes and moral reflexes that develop under a sort of captured version of identity politics um, isn't equipped to explain the kind of political realities that Taylor is talking about. Um, so 
from here, I want to just tie it to two things in the present moment that I think are, first of all, closely linked and are important aspects where elite capture represents a certain kind of problem. And elite capture, you know, we shouldn't think of as an on and off switch. Um, I think elite capture is more like a thermometer. There's more or less elite capture. And what explains how much elite capture there is has to do with the balance of pow power between elites and non-elites. And where elites get too much power relative to non-elites, you're likely to have worse elite capture problems. And I think a particular place where we should be thinking about elite capture and thinking about it explicitly as such is with police violence. So the US system of policing that people are out in the streets protesting against evolved essentially for the expressed purpose, the very thinly veiled purpose of maintaining exploitative economic systems and maintaining oppressive social hierarchies. So in the South, the organizational predecessor to modern police departments were the slave patrols. They were protecting private property, specifically the private property um, embodied in enslaved Africans. Um, and in the North, the primary spurs for the de development of the things that became modern police departments were union busting, strike breaking, and immigrant monitor monitoring, which were um, very tied together. Um, in the last 20 years of the 19th century, New York City alone had over 5,000 strikes, Chicago over 2,000. And they responded to this by developing what became modern police forces. They gave um, alarm boxes to businessmen or other distinguished gentlemen to be able to call at the first sign of worker unrest. And the point of this was to preserve profit-making activities and social hierarchies for elites. Today, the picture has a different cast of characters, but the broad function of this institution does the same thing that's always done, which is protect um, power, in terms of hierarchy and power in terms of profit. Police unions use their strategic position to intimidate larger labor unions into silence on police brutality, um, even though they meet solid resistance from smaller unions and rank and file workers, um, particularly the AFL-CIO, which has faced um, years of work of un different unions and different chapters asking for disaffiliation with police unions. Um, prosecutors who often largely see that office as a stepping stone for larger political gains um, have immense discretionary power to decide whom to charge and how severely. And they're playing the very simple game of how do I get the next political office rather than the complicated game of how do I serve justice. Um, and first and foremost, perhaps, the prison industrial complex is a $182 billion industry. Lots of that funding goes to corrections agencies and public employees, and it's supervised by public elected officials. Um, the profits associated with this go to the shareholders of companies that provide materials and services to captive populations and extract coerced labor from them. And no one elects these shareholders, and there isn't even the pretense of accountability for so I think there's a strong elite capture problem with police violence, and it's the reason why these institutions don't respond to the justified complaints of people, especially Black and Native people, against the constant present violence of police brutality. The same is true of climate change. Um, the reason why climate denial lasted so long was aided and abetted by many companies. Um, there have been exposés about freight rail companies, coal companies, and oil companies all running specific targeted campaigns to poison scientific research communication networks. Um, they engage in greenwashing advertising to change public opinion and to create social license for increased fossil fuel extraction. Um, they 
blatantly intimidate um, and use calculated violence against indigenous communities. And the political backdrop of this, um, which we've seen recently, is utter impunity. Um, in the last few months, Trump has rolled back regulations that could constrain companies like the companies who are complicit in poisoning the research wells. And the emergency COVID response le legislation granted unprecedented discretionary power to Steven Mnuchin, who's the secretary of the US Treasury and who rose to political prominence by foreclosing on untold numbers of people. He was the foreclosure king of California. The vast majority of the people who were affected by this, um, disproportionately, I should say, were black and brown Californians. Um, and this emergency legislation had to um, pass power to grant over $500 billion of taxpayer money has come without oversight and accountability and he's explicitly denied the request to track where the money is going. So we can only guess how much of that money fossil fuels and other emitting industries got. Um, so I just wanna quickly mention a couple of things that we can do about these elite capture problems in both of these cases. Um, a lot of people have been rightly talking about police abolition and defunding the police. Um, and in principle, these are ideas that I think I, that are worth everyone's time. I personally think of myself as an abolitionist. Um, but I think we need to think very carefully about the political institutions where that's going to be a possibility. Budgets come up for review every year. Um, if we defund this year and we're out of the streets next year, you know, who knows what that process looks like next year. So while I agree in principle with many of the demands that have been called for by people asking for revised budgets or total defunding or total abolition of departments, I think rather than asking the state to take better actions or to better manage its institutions, I think we need to understand how many aspects of the system are directly incentivized one way or another, often in multiple ways, to preserve the status quo. Um, I think the only effective counterweight that we can have to that is empowering communities and not just trying to take powers away from the state. I think we have to do both. So I think if you're an abolitionist, you should also want to increase community power over these institutions. And so I think the right framing demand is community control over police, which would establish civilian boards with hiring, firing, and direct control over police departments, which means that policing districts can vote to abolish their department. They can um, establish priorities. And if they decide to retain their department, and they can do a number of things in between. Um, so I just want to mention that. I think we'll have time to talk about it in the discussion. The other thing that I want to mention is an idea called bargaining for the common good. And this idea is being, um, it's been tried out by an SEIU local in Minnesota, and more people are talking about it these days. The folks over at Forge Organizing have put together a map um, showing when contracts are in, expiring around the country in order to allow this approach of bargaining for the common good to proliferate. So the approach is, um, instead of just having workers, organized workers bargaining against corporations for concessions that are usually targeted around working conditions, you can encourage partnership and co-work between community organizations and unions um, in order to have a more stronger, sorry, a stronger counterweight against corporate, the other side of the bargaining table. So instead of the bargaining corporation just going up against workers, now they're going up against the whole community. And that changes the scope of the things that can be bargained for. Um, and I think perhaps just as importantly, it changes the power dynamics. It changes how much power 
corporations are confronting. Now the unions have backup. And I think it's these kinds of tactics and these kinds of techniques and these kinds of grappling with how institutions work that are going to be part and parcel of an effective response to the police and an effective um, worker-led, grassroots-led, community-led response to climate change. Thank you. Amazing, Femi, that was great. Um, I think uh, the point you left off at, uh, really brought to mind to me what I think probably the black left and maybe more broadly the left has missed with leveraging identity politics as a sort of cudgel is the idea that there's sort of all these class dynamics that are in play. And you astutely noted um, even having Mayor Bowser or uh, the, the Freddie Gray case or the Obama years. Um, could you speak a little bit more about how maybe the left missed the boat by not leveraging class more, uh, class solidarity, or in, and instead being focused on like uh, race essentialism as opposed to class solidarity? Yeah. Um, I think a lot of people, I think both sides of this agree that there's something special about class, right? Um, and, you know, people who are pro um, a different form of identity politics, um, perhaps the form of identity politics that I would think of as captured elite captured identity politics. Um, think of people who stress class um, as dangerous. You know, there's the idea that um, there's the pejorative class reductionist, so on and so forth. And of course, the people that they're calling class reductionists, the people who um, think in terms of class first or something like that, also agree that something special is going on with class. We just disagree about what the special thing is. Um, I would say, um, I think agreeing with how you pose the question, what class forces you to do, what thinking about class forces you to do, um, is confront a kind of oppression that's quite difficult to address in symbolic terms, right? So again, thinking about Muriel Bowser's kind of use of identity politics, right? Um, she painted the street, right? She had the street painted and she, you know, named the sign, named the, named the section of the street after the Black Lives Matter movement. And, you know, a lot of people, a lot of people I respect, right? Not particularly, you know, unaware or particularly, particularly politically naive people. A lot of people greatly respected that move and were greatly encouraged by it. Um, and sure, if you sat them down and told them the full story of what the police budget she offered was, you know, you could engineer some skepticism, but that's you know, it's, we're not in a marketplace of ideas, right? People are getting a thousand messages at once and people aren't tracking all of these sorts of things. Um, so, you know, if that counts as a move in racial justice space, it does so because for whatever reason, we now think of um, racial justice, at least partially, I would argue, um, to a large extent in symbolic terms. Um, so, you know, we had a first black president, we have more black representation in media, um, and it's just an article of unspoken faith that something material will come out on the other end. And you maybe could get versions like that going, but it's just hard to, you know, it's hard to confront a union striking for higher wages and for health care and to offer them, you know, symbolic concessions, right? I, you know, I don't, I don't think there's anything, there's any deep conceptual point there. Um, you know, you could cook up purely symbolic class concessions, but I, you know, I'm just, it's just a conjecture. I, you don't see it, 
right? You know, you rarely see a union of, you know, people who are very bad off fighting for things other than material concessions from the institutions that they're confronting. Um, and so I think that respect, um, if nothing else, is already a good enough reason to take class seriously. And to the extent that the left has failed to do that in recent years, I agree with you that that's a serious problem. Great, great. And I, and I think um, you, be you beautifully mentioned two ways we can leverage real politique in this moment to drive change. How do you think about sustaining the energy of this movement and not letting it go, not letting it grow in such a way where we can see things um, and then elite capture occurs down the line. Is there a way to sort of, I guess, um, foolproof the, the, the next steps in this process? Yeah, it's a good question. Um, and I think it ties back to something I said in the middle or towards the beginning of the explanation of elite capture where, um, Elite capture is something that you can have more or less of, but it's probably hard to either totally eliminate or in the other direction have totally hegemonic, right? So even, you know, under the gravest conditions of um, elite capture when chattel slavery, when the elites literally owned other people, um, the other people still had their own politics and still fomented rebellions constantly and still had their own understanding of what was good for them and so on and so forth. Right? Um, so the slave aristocracy can, couldn't control everything and they got as close to it as I think is conceivable. That said, I think what that means for our strategy in the present means that the things we win now have to be the sort of things that would prevent, um, that would make it difficult for elites to roll back later. And I think that's why particularly the community control over police demand is especially strategic. Because even if you win the concession now from elites, okay, we're going to um, defund police um, or, or we're going to defund them to zero. We're going to abolish police in this district or that state. Um, you don't actually thereby change who's in charge of making the decision next year of what the budget is going to be or what institutions are going to make or what institutions are going to happen next year, right? Um, and that's a problem because the people in control of the institutions that make those decisions have the characterization I was talking about earlier. It's prosecutors and police unions and you know, mayors on both sides of the partisan aisle, right? All of whom are tied by incentives to maintaining the cer certain structure and all of whom are propped up by financial interests who we don't even have the pretense of electing, right? Just shareholders of the companies that sell stuff to prisons or exploit prison labor or both, right? So if those people remain in charge of things, whatever we concession, whatever concession we win now is gonna be gone in a year, unless the concession that we win now is about who's in charge of things next year. And so that's why I think we need community control over police. If we want to abolish police, we need the power to keep them abolished. If we want to defund police, we need the power to keep them defunded. Um, if we want to do anything else, we need the power to keep that. Um, and as long as elites are deciding what's happening, we're not going to um, have lasting change. Got you, got you. And I, I want to expand our lens a little bit globally. Um, do you think this idea, the idea of leak capture, is it extensible to, let's say, governments that aren't purely rapaciously capitalist, like communist governments or socialist governments? Do they still struggle with the idea of leak capture as well? I think so. Um, so one thing that um, I often say when I present a leak capture, but which I didn't get to say in the article, is that 
elite capture is more or less built into capitalism as a distributed system, right? Um, capitalism is a system that distributes goods and power via a system of production. Um, and characteristic to that system is there's a small group of people with control over the means of production, and as a result, um, control over production. And if you buy, as materialists do, that society revolves around production, that's going to translate into social control. More directly, in some senses, like wealth, a little indirectly, in other senses, like attention and political agendas. Um, but it turns out you can buy those. So um, it's built into capitalism. It's not built into communism, but it could still happen. Um, and so a lot of the aspects of you know a communist government, for example, um, are and how susceptible it is to elite capture are going to come down to um, important design choices. Um, how do we staff the bureaucracy? Do we have a bureaucracy in the first place, right? Um, how do we make um, how do we make decisions at the level of economic sectors, right? Um, do we have a permanent or rotating bureaucratic class? Um, what's our system of education and um, how well distributed is it? It's going to come down to these, you know, kind of wonky design choices. Um, so I think it's less that you're going to have elite capture in com capitalism and you're not going to have it in communism and more that you're definitely going to have it in capitalism. You might have it in communism, um, depending on how vanguardist you are and all that sort of thing. And you can from that perspective, you can regard anarchism as a deep skepticism about whether or not communism can avoid an elite capture problem. Um, so I think there's a lot of interesting intellectual space there, but that's what I would say. And to, and to bring it back to our, our political moment in the US, we obviously have a huge election coming up in November, but it doesn't seem like uh, a Biden presidency will truly address this in any sort of way. There may be more black professional managerial class um, elected officials in power, but I don't, I don't think, I think you're in, in reading and in listening to you, I think there's a sense of hope that you don't think, you, uh, I, I think it seems like uh, you've captured the specific problem and you're hopeful that we will be able to, under, by understanding elite capture, move towards a place where uh, establishment politics doesn't hold us back. Is that a, a, a fair reading? Yeah, I think that's a fair reading. Um, and I think the reason why I'm hopeful is because I'm seeing people and groups and union locals um, start to advocate what I think are the non-establishment politics that could be decisive if we all get behind it, right? And so what Forge Organizing is doing with the map um, tied to um, bargaining for the common good, what um, PACA is doing, um, Pan-African Community Action and advocating for community control over police. I think, you know, Biden versus Trump is just, you know, Biden put it the best himself, you know, um, do you want to get shot in the heart or do you want to get shot in the leg, right? That's, that's the choice we have up there, you know. Yeah. <laughs> um, I, I, I think it's all about damage control at that level. Yeah. Um, but what could be decisive is a new kind of grassroots politics key to the possibilities of the moment. And geopolitically, there might be some new interesting possibilities. It's too early to say what this means or where this will go, but um, to my understanding, every single African nation signed on to Burkina Faso's um, 
petition to get the UN Human Rights Council to investigate the United States. And I'm not aware of that happening to a first world country um, in the way that um, this is starting to shape up to see. Um, and you know, this is the kind of Pan-African unity Malcolm was talking about in the 60s. And it could change the state of play transnationally between nations um, in a way that could open up possibilities at the grassroots level um, and between grassroots locations, right? So I think, you know, our, our formal institutions have failed us. They will continue to fail us. Um, that's not to say that it doesn't matter how they fail us, right? Um, open fascism, eco-fascism is a very present threat. Um, arguably underway in the United States and Brazil and elsewhere. Um, and we should not want that to be our opponent. Um, but we're going to have to fight the formal institutions one way or other. Um, but I feel as though people are starting to identify strategies with real promise. Yeah, this is this is amazing, Femi. And uh, we, we've come up on time, but I really want to thank you for taking the time out to explore these ideas. I think you're unpacking a very verdant field of, uh, of new ideas. And uh, I'm really excited for what you do next.